In the last lesson, we learned the general strategy for tackling the argument essay. Over the next two lessons, we'll look at some tips for handling the first four steps of this strategy. Here, we are essentially identifying points to discuss in our essay. Now, the first step is to determine which category of instructions accompanies the argument. This is an important step, since this will guide the focus of our analysis. Now, in the last lesson, we learned that there are eight possible sets of instructions, and we learned that each of them can be categorized as one of the following three types. To help identify which category of instructions you've received, please recall that six of the eight possible sets of instructions are classified as extra evidence needed instructions. The other two categories have only one set of instructions each. Now, these are the instructions for the assumption and roles category, and these are the instructions for the other explanations category. Any other instructions you see will fall in the extra evidence needed category. Okay, so once we've identified the type of instructions, we're ready to begin analyzing the argument. So from here, our next step is to identify and summarize the premises used in the argument and also the argument's conclusion. Now, this is a crucial step since our task is to critique how well the author's conclusion follows from the premises, and we cannot do that if we have not yet identified key parts of the argument. Okay, so once we have an idea of the general structure of the argument, we're ready for the next step, which is to list some flaws and choose two to four of them to work with. To help us identify flaws, we should first determine whether the author uses any of the common argumentative strategies to draw his or her conclusion. The three most common strategies are cause and effect, statistical, and analogy. With each strategy, watch out for common mistakes associated with it. For example, with cause and effect arguments, a common mistake is to conclude that x causes y when it could be the case that y causes x, or perhaps some other factor causes y. For statistical arguments, a common flaw is that the sample does not represent the entire population or sometimes the conclusion does not match the statistics. For analogy arguments, the author takes two things that share a certain set of characteristics and then makes conclusions about additional characteristics that the two things should share. For analogy arguments, there may not be enough similarity between the two analogous things to draw reasonable conclusions. Now please note that we cover all of these flaws in much greater detail in the reading comprehension module. All right, so in addition to watching out for the flaws associated with the three most common argumentative strategies, we should also watch out for other common flaws. For example, watch out for any unsubstantiated assumptions the author makes in drawing a conclusion. Also, watch out for the use of vague or ambiguous words. For example, words like some, many, and few can have many different interpretations. So an argument that uses these words may not provide the evidence required to justify the author's conclusion. Another common flaw is failing to consider the basic fundamentals of supply and demand. So if an argument is related to business, check whether the author has failed to consider the laws of supply and demand when drawing his or her conclusion. Finally, one of the most common mistakes is taking weak evidence and using it to draw a very strong conclusion. All right, at this point, we've examined the first three steps in our general strategy for the argument essay. Now let's apply these steps to the following argument. So to begin, we'll determine the category of instructions. When we check the instructions, we see that they fall in the category of assumptions and roles. This means our critique of the argument will emphasize assumptions. From here, our next step is to identify the premises and the conclusion in the argument. So let's remove the instructions for now. Beginning with the premises, we're told that color photographs are more true to life. Magazines use color photographs more than black and white photographs. Many newspapers are starting to use color photographs. Portrait studios use more color photographs. And there are more types of color film than there are of black and white film. Given this evidence, the author concludes that photographers who work in color will have an advantage over those who work in black and white. All right, now that we've summarized the argument, we're ready to start generating discussion points for our essay. We'll cover this in the next lesson.